Um, I think I have to wait until now you appear stop sharing. Okay. Ah, stop. Okay. <laughs> My fault. Okay. Um, so I think now you should be able to see the slides, right? Yeah, perfect. Okay. Um, Although there's some I'm black. Okay, no, not fine. Yeah. Um, where's something black? Oh, it's fine. No, it's fine. Okay, good. Um, so in the previous talk, I think we learned a lot about the foundations of quant state RDMFT and also how to approximate uh, universal functionals. And now in this talk, I want to um, move uh, onwards and I would like to present to you uh, whether new ensemble reduced density matrix functional theory, which allows us also to extract um, excited state energies. And this is work which was done in collaboration with Pastin Schilling, who's my supervisor at the LMU in Munich, and also Federico Castello and Tropoli Blabé, who supported us a lot on the mathematical side. So let me also start with a short motivation, um, also to make sure that we use the same notation in the following. So we have the one RDM as our main variable in RDMFT, and we define it here in the following way. Um, we just trace out n minus one particles of the n particle density operator denoted by capital gamma. And then we normalize it to a total particle number. And this then has the effect that all the eigenvalues, they sum up to n, and we can identify them as the natural occupation numbers and also just the corresponding natural orbitals. And that's of course what was also exploited um, in the previous talk by Mario Pires. And now we have a look at the Hamiltonian this consists of two terms. First, we have a one particle Hamiltonian small h, and the second term is an interaction. And now we can make two observations. First of all, on the one particle Hamiltonian and the one RDM, they are conjugate variables in the sense that the knowledge of the one RDM of your system is sufficient to calculate the expectation value of any one particle Hamiltonian. And second, we usually deal with some fixed interaction so this could be, for example, color interaction for interacting electrons, but of course you're not restricted to this. So you could also have some, um, I don't know, effective hard interaction in the field of auto cooled quantum gases. And there are many more examples. But now the important point is we keep this interaction fixed. And what this allows us is to parameterize our total Hamiltonian by the one particle Hamiltonian. And now the goal in RDMFT is we want to put a lot of effort into the term involving the interaction, and then afterwards solve the ground state problem for the entire class of one particle Hamiltonians um, simultaneously. And it was shown by Gilbert already in 1975 that this goal can be um, achieved, at least uh, in principle, because he proved the existence of an energy functional E, which is only a function of the one RDM. It also consists of two terms. Um, so you can identify the first term here, it originates from the one particle term in your total Hamiltonian, and then you have a universal functional which contains your interaction. And of course you see that F is universal in the sense that it only um, contains the interaction, which is fixed, and it doesn't contain any information about the one particle Hamiltonian. So that's already tells us two main advantages of RDMFT over other many particle methods. So first of all, compared to wave function based methods where you would need to start your calculation from scratch when you change your one particle Hamiltonian. In RDMFT, we can exploit the knowledge of the universal functional um, and then perform a rather simple minimization over the energy functional. Of course, this doesn't trivialize the constant problem because Calculating this universal functional is an extremely complicated task. And now um, in contrast to density functional theory where only um, the external potential can be varied, in RDMFT we can vary the total um, one particle Hamiltonian. So that's kinetic energy and external potential. And this means in particular that there are less terms in the universal functionals which need to be um, approximated. And then maybe a third point is that from a conceptual point of view, RDMFT should be well suited to describe also strongly correlated systems because 
explicitly allows the fraction of occupation numbers through those um, natural occupation numbers, lambda alpha, and those lambda alpha will appear like several times throughout the talk. So it may be good to keep this in mind. So now let me compare DFT and RD and FT on Mortano 11. So um, which methods or which approaches do we have? So if we're interested in solving the ground state problem, there are formalism for both like DFT and RDMFT. Um, then for excited state in DFT, there are two approaches. One is the time-dependent density functional theory, which was introduced also in the previous talk by Hardy Coase, and the foundation is um, provided in a, by a theorem in the letter here. And then our second approach is an ensemble density functional theory for excited states. But now, how does the situation look like uh, in RDMFT, where there's in principle also a time-dependent RDMFT? And if you're interested in the details, um, I would recommend you to have a look at the, also at the review article here. However, one big problem is that um, a rigorous mathematical foundation of time-dependent RDMFT is missing. So you don't have a counterpart of this theorem here, also for non-local potentials, at, as you would need it. Um, in the context of RDMFT. And an ensemble RDMFT um, was missing in the literature until recently, and it's the goal of this talk to introduce it to you. And I hope uh, we'll be able to convince you also that we um, can actually provide a rigorous mathematical foundation for ensemble RDMFT to target excited states in contrast to its um, time-dependent um, counterpart. So now, how does this um, ensemble RDMFT for excited states look like? We have two key ingredients. The first one is a variation of principle, and the second one is a constraint search. So that's basically a constraint optimization problem. But let us start with the variation of principle. So this goes under the name of Geokar variation of principle, according to um, Cos Oliveira and Co., who introduced this in 1988. So if we consider the simplest case, um, that's like just calculating the ground state energy, we all know the Rayleigh-Ritz variation of principle from quantum mechanics one. And it tells us that the ground state energy is obtained from minimizing over all n particle states. And here you have the expectation value of the energy. So we can illustrate this in the following way, namely that all the weight sits on the slowest energy level E1, which is the ground state energy, and now a natural question to ask is what happens if we reduce this weight on the lowest energy level and replace some non-zero weight also on E2. So if one does this, one arrives at a slightly modified variation of principle. We have now two non-zero weights, W1 and W2. They are ordered decreasingly, just means that W1 is larger equal W2. And then instead of minimizing over the m particle states psi, we minimize over the unparticle density operators with a fixed spectrum given by W1 and W2. And here we have again only the expectation value of the energy. And what you arrive at is um, the weighted sum of the constant energy and the first excited state energy. So now if you would, for example, simply choose W1 and W2 both equal to one half, you would get an equal mixture of um, E1 and E2 as um, you would also expect. So now we can move onwards and place more and more non-zero weights on higher energy levels. And maybe from the previous slide, you can already guess where we'll arrive. So we minimize over the m particle density operators, Kelvin gamma, which are in the set En of W. And this set is simply the set of the m particle density operators whose spectrum is given by the weight vector. So that's the vector of all those weight, W1, W2, and so on. And then the down arrow just means that I order the eigenvalues of capital gamma decreasingly. And what you obtain from the minimization here on the right-hand side is then the weighted sum of the lowest eigenenergies, Ej, which we just denote by the symbol E and then lower index, um, the weight vector. So maybe one important um, comment here, which one should keep in mind is that in the end, um, you will always choose a finite number of non-zero weights. And this is then also the number of um, accessible energy levels or excited states energy in your um, omega ensemble RDMFT. 
So now we just um, copy this variational principle and we go to the constraint search. So here um, I just copy and pasted this um, first line. Nothing happened. I just wrote the total Hamiltonian as a sum of the one particle Hamiltonian and the interaction. And now, of course, we need to arrive at a functional theory. This is an analogy to um, the constraint search for ground state RDMF team. So you simply split um, the trace over M particles at the plus sign. Then the first term immediately reduces to the trace over only one particle. And for the interaction, we also split the minimization such that we first minimize over the M particle density operators mapping to a given one RDM. And then afterwards, we minimize the entire expression over all um, one RDMs. But now we can just um, take the second term here and define it as our universal functional F. So this looks very sim similar to um, the energy functional by Gilbert, which I showed on the second slide. However, this functional here now depends also on the weight vector. So what we arrived at is some functional which lives on a domain and it maps to the real numbers. So now, of course, to apply this um, W ensemble RDMF team practice, we would need to have access to the domain of the functional. But the problem here is that in general, EN of W and therefore also E1N of W won't be convex. And in particular, E1N of W will be way too complicated to describe. So that's very um, hopeless. And you can understand it in the following way. Because um, our W is on the RDMFT it contains the ground state RDMFT as a special case. So this would just mean to set here for the weight vector 1, 0, 0, 0. Then the blue set would be the set of all pure state and representable one RDMs. Um, but we know that for fermions, you cannot describe the set due to the generalized Pauli constraints. And therefore, if you take a uh, like arbitrary weight vector, we can conclude that describing this set here will be even more complicated. But now how to um, circumvent this problem while the key idea is to apply some exact convex relaxation scheme. And here the word exact simply means that um, through this convex relaxation, we don't change the outcome of our energy minimization. And um, to apply this convex realization, um, this consists of two steps. So first of all, you replace this horrible blue set by its convex hull. And then one can show that on the level of the functional, this means to replace a possibly non-convex blue functional, which lives on the blue domain, by its lower convex envelope. This has also two advantages. First of all, if we minimize over a convex functional, we don't have the problem of ending up at a um, local minima instead of um, a global one. And second, um, this allowed us to turn our excited state RDMFT into a practical method. And we were actually able to obtain an efficient and compact description of this convex hull here. This description, however, is technically very involved and therefore I don't want to bother you with it at the moment. And I would rather like to discuss one of the um, remarkable consequences namely that we find a hierarchy of generalized exclusion principle constraints. So let me first explain this on a qualitative level. So here R just denotes the number of non-vanishing weights. So for R equal one, we have one non-zero weight, so we will cover ground state RDMFT. For R equal two, we have two non-zero weights and so on. And then here, um, the gray polytope presents um, the set of allowed occupation numbers occupation number vectors. So if we start um, for i equal one for fermions, um, you could think of as this line being some lambda i, um, and then on the vertical axis you have lambda j, and both of them can be between zero and one. So you can cover the entire square. So now if we go to i equal two, we find that there are additional constraints which restrict the set of um, possible occupation number vectors further. And as a result, um, the set becomes smaller. And now if we increase R, we always get additional constraints. Um, and of course, I mean, we can also quantify this. And to explain a bit better what I mean by hierarchy, I would also like to show you um, the explicit inequalities. Um, of course, the exact form is not important. 
Um, so here we have i equal one up to three. So we somehow cut we cut out i equal four because um, that's already sufficient to show um, the scheme. So for i equal one, we have gone state adimichi. So here you have just the Pauli exclusion principle. And down arrow again means that we order all the occupation numbers um, decreasingly. And then for i equal two, we get one additional constraint. And this is now more restrictive than the Pauli exclusion principle, which you can also see quite easily because if you just sum up um, the n largest eigenvalues, Pauli would tell you this should be low or equal n. But now we have here an additional term which is um, leads to a more restrictive constraint since w1 um, will be lower than one and therefore this term is negative. And then for i equal three, you have again those two constraints plus one additional one and so on. So to emphasize this um, a bit further, I would also like to show you the table here. So in the first line, we have r from one up to 12. Then we have the number of vertices of the polytopes on the previous slide, so that's not so important now. We have the number of inequalities and the number of new inequalities. So if you go to r equal four, you see we have the three inequalities, which I showed to you on the previous slide, plus two new inequalities. And then for i equal five, you have the five inequalities from i equal four plus three new. And this is what we then um, define as this hierarchy of generalized exclusion principle constraints. And one more important insight is that those inequalities die effectively independent of the total particle number n and the dimension of your one particle Hilbert space small d. And this is, um, on one hand, an analogy to um, the Pauli exclusion principle, which also tells you that all the occupation numbers should be between zero and one, independent of n and t. Um, but in, on the other hand, it's um, in striking contrast to the generalized um, Pauli exclusion principle, no, yeah, to the generalized um, Pauli constraints with, which were um, studied by Klatschko um, which depend strongly on N and D. And maybe as a last comment, so far I've only discussed the Fermionic case, but you can repeat also all the steps for boson. So nothing really changes except for the characterization of your domain, because there, of course, you have to take into account the different statistics. And then we will arrive um, at similar um, inequalities, which constrain our um, allowed occupation numbers. And this then leads to a personic exclusion principle for mixed states, and that's also illustrated to you. So the triangle basically plays the whole what of um, the square for the fermions. So for bosons, you can have occupation numbers between zero and n, and um, maybe then the diagonal you can think of as all the occupation numbers summing up um, to the total particle number. But now if we um, go to the mixed states we have additional constraints which um, restrict us to this um, gray polytope inside the triangle. So now let me um, provide you a short summary. So we started with the foundations of an ensemble RDMFT for excited states. This consists of two parts. First of all, a variation of principle, and then a constraint search, which allowed us um, to define our universal functional. However, the problem was that the domain of the function was way too complicated to um, describe and practice. And here the key idea was to apply an exact convex relaxation, which allowed us to obtain an uh, efficient description of the functionalist domain. And we also discussed um, one of the remarkable consequences, namely that we found a hierarchy of um, generalized exclusion principle constraints for mixed quantum states. So yes, I would like to thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Julia, for this very nice presentation. So we have uh, quite some time now, seven minutes uh, for questions. Uh, so for instance, Patrick Thunström had one question. Um, no, so I, I, <laughs> I tried to clap my hand, but I raised the hand instead <laughs> by mistake, sorry. Bad luck for you, because now I need to ask questions. So. Does anybody else have a question for Julia?
So no questions uh, from the audience. So you can briefly comment on, on these bosons, like uh, if you consider now like are larger than one to, to take into account excited states. Uh, I mean, how is this related to the possibility to have like complete Bose-Einstein condensation? Um, well, for bosons, the situation is different in the sense that, um, okay, I'm not exactly clear what you want me to explain, but if you um, think about this point, the origin, as a point where all the occupation numbers except the one in which the BC occurs are equal to zero. So this would be for homogeneous positive gas, it would be the zero momentum state in which the bosons condense. And um, then if you here um, cut out um, the origin, this already tells you that um, if you enforce um, excitations into your system, of course, you can never reach uh, BC again, but I think that's also what you would expect from a very naive picture. Yeah, I see. So this is then exactly the same, in some sense, as for fermions, where considering a mixture of the first few excited states means you cannot reach the Hartree Fock point anymore. So the occupation numbers have to be fractional. Yes, exactly. Okay. I think maybe it was also interesting what you didn't mention. Maybe I can briefly add this. So these constraints actually for ensemble RDMFT, they're also valid in ensemble DFT. So they have to be they have to be overlooked actually in the history of ensemble DFT. But one has to also say at the same time, they're less restrictive in DFT, in lattice DFT than in RDMFT. But there's also a question by Yannick. Yeah, um, just a quick question. I think we discussed this uh, at the last MCQST conference, but you haven't yet uh, tried to incorporate this in any of the approximate uh, NOF approaches, right? Um, no, not yet. So um, in this talk, I only presented the solution um, to characterizing the domain. Of course, the next step you write would be to obtain approximations of the functional, and that's what we are currently working on. But it's not, um, yeah, it's not that trivial. So you can, it's not possible to simply cover all the ideas from gone state RDMFT, even if you, yeah, would like to go along similar lines. Okay, thanks. So I'm not sure whether we discussed this then during this MCQST conference, Yannick, but what's really, I think, exciting or what's really striking us is that at least for weakly correlated uh, fermions, almost all of the information about the excited states is hidden in the boundary of those uh, polytopes. Uh, so the generalization of the Pauli principle kind of contains the information about the structure of the excited states, at least for weakly correlated systems. And this is actually already a starting point to construct a functional, to function for the excited states, uh, at least in the regime of weak interaction. Uh, we can discuss maybe another time. So, so sure. are there any, sure. any further questions? Sir? Maybe if not, uh, then let us thank Julia and also all the other speakers of this session again. So I think it was really like a very exciting, all these four talks. Uh, so thank you all. Ray Tao, Hardy, Mario, and Julia. Um,